Shorebirds have been part of my life for around 15 years, but it was five years ago, when I retired, that they completely took over. In case anyone is concerned with some of the video coming up, thinking I might be getting too close, here's a demonstration of how far away I can be and still capture the shorebirds. This is the view from my living room, zooming in to the pied oyster catch a nest. Here's a glimpse of the port hacking area where the shorebirds nest, eat and roost. This is Gunnamatta Bay, Cabbage Tree Basin, Cabbage Tree Creek, D-Band Spit Beach and the D-Band Spit Tidal Flats. From the air, this is the Bonnie Bay Lagoon looking down Cabbage Tree Creek, D-Band Spit Beach and swinging round to Gunnamatta Bay. From the opposite angle, flying up the Spit Beach and then down into the area known as Cabbage Tree Basin. This is the D-Band Spit Beach at a 1.7 metre tide. It is an overcast day, so the curlews and godwits are able to use the spit rather than the traditional roost, which is almost underwater, though the pelicans are still happy to use it. Then running across the tidal flats towards the spit as the tide recedes and a panorama of the whole tidal flats at low tide looking down to Costons Point. At high tide, the tidal flats and the D-band spit beach are separated by a fast running 30 metre wide channel. This is a panorama of the tidal flats on the left side of the roost site as high tide is receding and the birds have just moved off roost to start feeding. It looks ideal, very quiet and five days a week, that is mostly true. On hot weekends, however, this is what the spit turns into and this is one of the big tides. So the Sand Island Roost site is underwater and the birds have left. The Sand Island Roost only started opening up two seasons ago and is now the preferred spot for birds to roost as it can be less busy than the spit. Unfortunately, it is also turning into a favourite spot for people to bring their dogs or kids, both of which like to chase birds. Some days it's a procession. As one leaves, another arrives. So why do the birds hang out here, despite how busy the area can get? Food, glorious food. The area has nippers. Soldier crabs. Black crabs. Worms. And oysters. all of which both birds and people make use of. The area hosts two bird species on the EPBC Act list, the Eastern Curlew and Red Knot. and three listed in the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Act of 2016, the Tarek Sandpiper, Hide Oyster Catcher and Little Tern. We've noticed via bouncing daily counts that this area is just as important as a refuelling transit stop 
as it is for birds that spend the whole summer. The green shank was a refueler, and we can see how slim the godwits initially looked compared to how they looked two months later when half the flock moved on. So how did 2019 pan out for us? January saw us fledge the first pied oyster catch a chick on a public Sydney beach in around 25 years. Over the Christmas New Year period, which was two weeks short of fledging, we had a group of volunteers which were staked out around the Bonnyvale Lagoon. Two hours either side of high tide, we shut the lagoon down to through traffic. Not one of the beach walkers or kayakers knew that birds use beaches to nest on. They asked lots of questions and were happy to sit, wait and watch the show. This allowed the oyster catcher chick to safely swim without being skittled and not be left trapped on the beach or drowning in the mangroves with the rising tide. It was a long 79 days from first egg through the fledging. This was the first flight and I was so thankful that the chick did not break a wing with that landing. The oyster catchers didn't do us any favours this year with all four nests being laid on a Friday, meaning we had to protect a nest site that could be approached by any person through a full 360 degrees with no fencing all weekend. 30 seconds after this egg was laid, the nest was surrounded by three teenage boys picking the egg up. There was much screaming and shouting from my balcony to get them to put the egg down. We thought that nesting was over just as it had started. That nest was only one week short of hatching when the foxes took it out. The last four years we've had one breeding pair of oyster catchers. This year there were two, but unfortunately foxes took out all four of the nests plus two of the masked lapwings. One pair of lapwings did successfully fledge a chick, but they nested in the closed section of the Bonnyvale campgrounds rather than on the beach. Just prior to the 2019 migration from Australia, we lost one of the curlews, which had torn half a wing off. It left the tidal flats and headed for the mangroves of Bonnyvale Lagoon. We tried tracking it to capture it, but it moved deep down the channel and we never saw it again. Autumn saw the arrival of the double banded plovers and we worked out through a couple of counts at Port Hacking and Boat Harbour, done at the same time, on the same day, that some of the population we host is being shared. The end of this clip is just before they left to go back to New Zealand for breeding. 2019 saw only one overwintering curlew, which preferred to mostly use the shallow Bonnyvale Lagoon for both feeding and roosting. An East Coast low had eroded the last of the vegetated dunes, washing the vegetation into the middle of the lagoon. This provided the curlew with artificial roost sites, giving it 360 degree views out to around 200 to 300 metres with shallow water all around. While here, the curlew was mostly feeding on black crabs rather than nippers. The only downside with the roost site was it was right underneath the sea eagle track, backwards and forwards from the nest it had down at the basin. The curlew would take off when the local birds sounded the raptor alarm call, circle behind the eagle, follow it to the other side of the bay, then peel off and return. On the 27th of July, four curlews arrived back. The average number this season was 16. Six did not return from migration, but up to 20 were seen some days during the transit phase and occasionally following days when they had returned after departing to other areas because the hacking had been too busy. Presumably they brought a few friends back that stayed for a day or two. The first of the Godwits arrived on 1 October, with one of them being a leg flag bird showing it had stopped at Chongming Island when flying up to the breeding grounds. I was expecting to only see the Godwits for perhaps two weeks, but we were hosting close to 70 for nine weeks. They all left for five days and I thought that was the last I'd see of them, but around 40 came back and numbers bounced from 20 to 40. Godwits used to be regulars, but five years ago they stopped summering here and only used the area for a brief transit stop. It was a joy to see them back. After two months, the group that had decided to stay started travelling further afield, spending time in Ganamata Bay feeding. A resident there said she hadn't seen them in the 20 years she's been living there. I thought the D-band split tidal flats can get busy, but it is nothing compared to how busy Ganamata Bay is. So our group are either incredibly tough not worried about humans being close to them, desperate, or a combination of all these. 
After seeing the leg flag god whip, I started dreaming about finding a leg flag curlew, and lo and behold, about five days later, I found one which had been flagged at Jiangsu by the research team at Nanjing Normal University in China in conjunction with the Wash Waders Ringing Group in the UK. For the migration season, these groups flagged 1,770 birds, eight of which were curlews and eight godwits. Pretty amazing to think we saw one of each given such small numbers. The leg flag curlew stayed the whole summer. I called her Jiangsu and having a flag bird let me learn a bit more about them. She had a regular territory on the tidal flat, which was just off the roosting zone. Not long after the birds start waking up, she starts to chase them off if they don't leave soon enough for her liking. If another bird stepped into her territory, there would be warning calls and charging to chase off the intruder. Other birds do the same, so maybe others also have a territory they consider theirs. Occasionally you can see two birds sharing a territory, and occasionally Jeng Su has a friend she doesn't mind sharing with. Moving now to threats. There is a saying, when laws are not enforced, anarchy follows. This summer I heard a politician say people want governments out of their lives. But if governments keep relying on people to self-regulate, then the situation for our environment and wildlife will only get worse. We have the usual bunch of threats such as foxes and also off-lead dogs on the spit beach disturbing the beach nesters. This was the newly fledged pied oyster catcher chick being chased by an off-lead dog. The spit is under council enforcement, but they are overworked and don't get to make it onto the beach. Then there are the other pets. This is an off-lead ferret. The early morning runners, deer and people that like to run the beach, which can trample nest and scatter roosting birds. Climate change along with king tides and big swell, which can wash out the roost and nesting sites and kayakers that like to paddle too close to roost sites. Nippers can be extracted in excessive limits, people dig up the tidal flats to extract soldier crabs, and there are groups of people that come through to extract shellfish even though their collection is forbidden. It turns into quite a crowd, and sometimes you go out to find the curlews completely surrounded, all huddled in the middle and not eating. Kayaks that rather than being paddled through the channel, decide to drag through the tidal flats. Speed limits being ignored over the very shallow tidal flats, scattering birds in their wake. There are some threats to the migratory birds that we are at a loss as to what to do. The tidal flats are land over which local council has no control. Many people, locals and boat owners, treat the tidal flats as a dog park. So often you see the birds being scattered by dogs running free. Many of these people think it cute the dog having so much fun chasing the birds. Now we have boats that have wheels driving across the feeding grounds, crushing the burrows where the food lives, or people driving cars off the boat ramp at Bonnyvale that tear up the Bonnyvale Lagoon or drive along the beach to the northern tip. There are no authorities I know of that can address these problems. What needs to be explored is how to give the birds a protected roost site to ensure they can rest peacefully rather than having to install a cross engraved with rest in peace, whether the current roost area can be declared a reserve, off limits to people, dogs and all watercraft, or whether an artificial roost site can be installed close by. As part of that, how to regulate it as a no-go area is just as important as gaining approval for the bird sanctuary zone. A joint effort between an official regulatory body and volunteer group could be a solution. Thus ends my talk but the birds want to have a final say. Hi! Hello! Over here! Can you hear this? No? Then let me turn it up for you. We are angry and we need your help. We birds want what you all take for granted. A safe home to eat and sleep in. We ask that people learn how to share our space so we too can have a future. Thanks for listening.